So I just needed to get all of that set up and going. For our lesson this morning, I wanted to focus our attention on the notion of transformation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing, increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This notion of transformation really lies at the heart of what our fundamental purpose is, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, to become people who look like and act like Christ did to be people who actually make a difference in the world around us. And that's exactly what Paul is speaking to here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As he points out to people that in the old covenant, the glory was wrapped up in the law that people were not able to achieve. But now the glory is available in Christ, and we are to be transformed into that likeness, and therefore glory. That's what God has for all of his people. But it comes about through transformation. See, Jesus, as we've often said, became like us so that we might become like him. He took upon himself flesh and blood. He gave up his divine power and might and right at God's right hand. He gave that up. He set it aside. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he did not consider that divine nature something to be grasped or held on to. But he gave it up and became like us so that we might in turn become like him. So that we might indeed become the children of God. Stephen on Sunday evenings has been uh, giving us a little series on why our relationship with God is characterized by adoption and how the actual process of adoption is similar to what we have in Christ. And the fact is, is that as an adopted child, we have all the same rights and privileges as the natural born child. We who are adopted into God's family through Christ are brothers with Christ fellow heirs with Christ. All of the same rights and privileges that Christ has. But there is transformation that is called for and required. You know, when you think about how the world began, there in the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. And Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden to tend it, to look after it to care for it. But they didn't have to impose anything on it. There weren't thorns and thistles. They didn't have that kind of pain and suffering because they were ruling with God over his creation. In fact, that's what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, where he says, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, the writer of Hebrews says, It's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Hmm. I mean, think about that. God left nothing that is not subject to him. That was the creation. That was the original. But then we see, the writer of Hebrews says, Yet at the present, we do not see everything subject to him. What were God's words to 
Adam after the sin in the Garden of Eden? <coughs> By the sweat of your brow shall you earn your bread. Suddenly, what had been a very easy, in a sense, easy, natural process became hard and became difficult and became painful and full of toil and trouble because of sin. Jesus came to earth to demonstrate what God had wanted and intended for man from the very beginning. And as Jesus walked the earth, what do we see about how he was able to control nature? Peace, be still, and the storm was calm. Healing the blind, allowing the deaf to hear. Jesus had control over all of the works of God's hands. And I believe that we're told here in Hebrews that that's what God intended for all of mankind. But sin got in the way. So Jesus came to reestablish God's rule over the earth. But of course, mankind was not ready to accept him. God knew that. And so Jesus gave his life that we might be saved and be transformed. Jesus came and he brought hope and healing into a world that was lost. And we as his people, as his body, need to be doing the same. To bring hope and healing to this world. And that's why as Christians we can never fall into the trap of being hateful towards other people. You know, we need to remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. Our enemy is not other people. Our enemy is Satan. Now, even those that have aligned themselves with Satan, they as people, are not our enemy. They are people like you and me who deserve God's love and forgiveness. And we need to love everyone, no matter who they are. Because that's the only way we can bring hope and healing into the world. If Jesus had not done that, we would have no hope. I mean, people did some pretty hateful things to him, didn't they? And think about, sort of to me, the epitome of it is what happened on the cross. As he's hanging on the cross, he's dying for the world, and these people are walking by and saying, huh, you claim to be the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, come down from there. No, then we'll, we'll, we'll believe you. Mocking him while he is suffering agony on the cross for them. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's what we are called to do and to be as his people, to be transformed. That's not the natural easy thing to do. The natural easy thing to do is to lash out. If someone says something or does something that's hurtful, the easy natural thing to do is just lash back. And we're called to be different. We're called to respond as Jesus did, with love, with kindness. But in order to be transformed, in order to be changed, it means we have to make a commitment to doing that. We have to be committed to allowing that to happen, having ears to hear, how many people heard the words that Jesus spoke? How many people had the opportunity to be transformed by his teaching and his example? And yet how many were? 
After his death, how many disciples came together there in that upper room? About 120. After three and a half years, thousands and thousands of people had heard the message, had seen him at work, and 120 were actually changed. Because they had ears to hear and the others didn't. We need to have the ears to hear and be ready to make the commitment to allow his words to change us and transform us. But that means we've got to be humble. We've got to recognize I don't know it all. I need help. I need lots of help. Always have, always will. Yeah, and that's true of all of us. To be eager to hear, eager to learn, eager to be changed. And we have to be willing to accept correction. I've always been struck by the example of the Apostle Peter, who, I mean, remember, Jesus kind of pretty harsh with him, you know, that time there in Caesarea Philippi, where... Jesus had said, I'm going to have to go die. And Peter said, no, no, Lord, not going to happen to you. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. I'd have been pretty ticked off if somebody said that to me. Peter responded in faith. That's what we get what we're willing to do. And we've got to be willing to accept correction even if it isn't given in the kindest possible way. The teaching of Jesus throughout his life brings transformation. And I'm going to say that I find that Jesus' teaching is uniquely challenging. Of all the various... I mean, I've, I've sat through lots of classes done lots of courses. What's challenging about studying the Bible is that it's more than just learning some information. I need to learn that information, but I've got to go way beyond that. It has to really change my life. And of course, the thing is, is that Jesus was certainly a great teacher. I mean, even those who do not believe in him as the Son of God recognize him as the greatest teacher, moral teacher of all history. But just recognizing that that is not enough because he's far more than that. Jesus, when he, in Mark chapter 2, those first 12 verses tell the occasion of Jesus in the house. And it was so crowded that people couldn't get into the house. And there was this paralyzed man whose friends really wanted to get him to Jesus. So we're told, beginning in verse 3, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now it's interesting that Jesus started with that instead of you're healed. But here's the point. I mean, the thing that Jesus was teaching was who has the right to forgive sins? I mean, if you think about it, if I am wronged, who has the right to forgive the person who wronged me other than me? And sin reflects doing wrong to God, so the only one who has the right to forgive that is God himself. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And the people there rightly recognized, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were absolutely right. 
And so immediately Jesus knew in his spirit this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. The point that Jesus was making is, you know, I can say your sins are forgiven. I, mean, I can say that. What does that mean? Is there any way of verifying? Is there any way of seeing? I mean, I can claim that I have that power, but how, how do I demonstrate it? And that was the whole point Jesus was making to these people was, I said, your sins are forgiven, and yeah, you're saying, uh-oh, who has the right to forgive sins? Well, I'm going to demonstrate to you that I do have that right. I'm going to say to this man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now, that they could see. And that's one of the problems I have with the, so many of the people who today claim to be able to heal by the power of God, is that when it is, I've got a really bad neck pain. I've had neck pain for a long time. Oh, we'll, we'll pray for you. We'll, well, someone says they're healed. Well, are they really? Did anything actually happen? But when there's a man there who's lost a leg, who has a withered arm, that doesn't change. That doesn't get transformed. Do they actually have the power they claim to have? And I think the answer is no. Jesus demonstrated, yes, he had the power to, do, to, to, to actually do what he claimed, to forgive sin. And then, in the last part of, Matthew, of Mark chapter 2, there's the account of Jesus' disciples walking through the field on the Sabbath day, and uh, they were plucking grain as they walked through the field, and the Pharisees said, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Well, actually... Plucking a few grains as you walked along was not what was unlawful. That was, a, that was actually one of those traditions that the Pharisees had established to keep people from breaking the Sabbath. The law was you weren't to do any reaping on the Sabbath. Don't get workers out there reaping the field. Don't do that. It's not a business day. It's a day of rest. But Jesus' response was to tell them and to point out to them. In the days, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. In other words, Another case, Jesus used the phrase, you need to understand, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. They had completely missed the point of the Sabbath day. And Jesus then goes on to say, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He was God. He was divine. And therefore, He is the one who is both the teacher and the curriculum. Both the teacher and the curriculum. He's the teacher and the thing being taught. For, as he said to the disciples shortly before he left them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's everything. Other people teach about God. He is God. 
Jesus in Matthew 23 talks about how the scribes and the Pharisees like to sit in Moses' seat, which as we've seen from our video series, that had to do with the special seat in the synagogue that the one who would bring the lesson would sit in. And they would sit there, and they would teach people about God. But he was God. He didn't just teach people about God. He is God. And he is the only teacher. He is the only one that has the wisdom, the only one with the way and the truth and the life. So when we look at Jesus, we look at both what he said and what he did. His words have beauty and resonance in their own right, but because it's backed up by his life, they have a meaning and an impact like none other. And his teaching, while there are facts and doctrines that are part of it, that's not what it's really ultimately about, is it? I mean, really, the teaching that Jesus brought is about relationships. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. there's, on these two, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. That's what it's all about. Relationships. Developing relationships with other people. No matter how badly we desire to know the scriptures, if we're not motivated by love, love for God and love for others, those things are totally empty. As Paul tells us, If I speak in the tongue of men or or of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, empty noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, That's what needs to be motivating us. That's what needs to be driving the transformation within us is a concern for others. A concern for all others, including those who are very different from us. But a concern for their well-being. And I want to sort of finish up by looking at how Jesus taught us in the Lord's Supper and what he taught us. We notice that, first of all, he began by washing the disciples' feet. Remember, they came in, they sat down for their meal, and he started out to wash their feet. And, of course, you remember the where he got to Peter, and what did Peter say? No, Lord, not my feet. And then Jesus said, okay, well, then you have no part of me. Oh, well, then wash my hands and my feet. But yeah, that was Peter. And actually, in a sense, Peter's response was understandable. I mean, Jesus was the teacher. He knew that. Jesus was the Son of God. He was just a man. Lord, let me wash your feet. Well, of course, he hadn't. None of them had started to wash the feet, right? They'd all waited because everybody was waiting for someone else to do it. So finally, Jesus did it. But Peter's response was actually, in one sense, appropriate. It was an appropriate recognition of who Jesus was, and of the difference in status between Jesus and Peter. But Jesus transformed that relationship. Jesus, by what he did, demonstrated that leaders need to serve. Jesus demonstrated by what he did that if you want to be a real leader, here's what you have to do. You're going to make a difference. 
You've got to be willing to serve. You've got to be willing to put others' needs ahead of your own. I will just mention that we also need as followers to allow leaders to serve. The Passover meal, of course, itself was a teaching ritual. When, Jesus, when God instituted it in the Old Testament, he said, every time you do it and your children say to you, what are we doing, you're to tell them. It was a reminder of the fact that they had been freed from slavery in Egypt, that God had acted with mighty power to deliver them and to free them. And the meal began as a typical, normal Passover meal. In Matthew chapter 26, in verses 18 through 20, we're told that, I mean, it's, it's Passover time, and Jesus said to his disciples, On the first day of the unle- uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into a city to a certain man and tell him the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Nothing untoward, nothing unusual, just a regular Passover meal, just the same as they had done their whole lives, a regular Passover meal. But Jesus totally transformed it. He totally changed it. Because when it got to the bread, he said in verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And remember what kind of bread was it they were using? The unleavened bread. What was the meaning of the unleavened bread? Oh, it was that they had to leave Egypt in haste. They didn't even have time to allow the bread to rise because they had to hurry up and get out of that place. They were needed to get going. Jesus took that same bread and said, No, this isn't about fleeing and haste anymore. This is about me. This is about the perfect life that I've lived. The perfect life that I'm going to offer on your behalf. That's what this bread now means. And then the cup. Jesus said, he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That cup, the cup of redemption, as the Jews called it, that cup of redemption was a cup, it was a time to remember that God had delivered them from slavery. But Jesus said that cup no longer represents that. That cup now represents the blood that I shed that provides for your forgiveness transformed and changed by Jesus actually becoming those elements. So that the bread, and now as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we don't remember the Passover and the exodus from Egypt. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember the body of Christ. The life that he lived, the perfect life that he offered for us. And we remember when we take the cup, the blood that he shed on the cross that provides for our forgiveness and ratified the new covenant by which we are redeemed. Transformation. Change. See, God loved us and he wants to change us in Christ. He wants us to take on within ourselves the likeness of Christ. And it's not getting rid of the world and its culture. The notion that somehow we should simply uh, withdraw ourselves out of the world completely is not what God had in mind. You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You can't do that if you're not in the world. 
but he wants us to transform it and to change it rather than allowing it to transform and change us. It's not just about the facts. It's not about memorizing lots and lots of scripture, although it doesn't hurt. But that's not, if that's all you do, it's kind of pointless. It's being transformed by those facts. It's being changed by those facts. being open to God's teaching wherever, whenever we go, whatever happens in our lives. It is following the example of Christ by teaching in how we speak and how we act every day. What we do make a difference. We need to be sure that the difference we're making is the difference that God wants us to make. I can make a difference by losing my temper. But is that the difference God wants me to make? I remember so well, and it was a real little slap in the face for me. Some friends who told me their little boy, this was a number of years ago in Zimbabwe, their little boy had suddenly started eating everything on his plate and then would ask for more. And they asked him, how come? What was going on? He said, well, I want to be big and fat like Uncle Jim when I grow up. Whoa. I made a difference in that boy's life. But my goodness, that's not the difference I'd want to make. So we need to be thoughtful about what we do, what we say, and how we act. Really, it's it's teaching by seeing the needs of others, responding to them in whatever way that we can. And we always need to ask ourselves, are we allowing the Spirit to work within us, to transform us? Because that's the intent. That's what God wants to do. But he won't force us. He won't compel us. But are we going to allow the Spirit to change us, to transform us into the likeness?